as the kids are filtering out, I don't know where, where Johnny just, he, Johnny hides. Where's Johnny at? Oh, there's Johnny right there. You're in black. I can't, you're in camouflage. You blend in with the pews. But uh, glory to God for the, for the praise team this morning. You guys sounded great. And I want to give a shout out to Gabe Freeman, who I just saw walking in the back. Gabe rocked the drums today. I loved it. He did a great job. So can we give Gabe Freeman a round of applause? As he just exited stage left, I just saw him. Love you, Gabe. He did a great job today. I, I, you, you have to take notice and you have to encourage the body of Christ, don't we? We're going to hear that today, encouraging one another. Linnell, my, my great, great niece, is one, so she might be vocal today. Look, look out. So let me begin. Who loves a good vacation, right? Florida, Hawaii, Alaska, wherever you're going. Who loves coming home from a vacation? Some of us need a vacation from the vacation. Have you ever had one of those trips home? We've had this recently where the traffic, as you come into Nashville, is just backed up beyond reason, and the pastor's ready to use words he shouldn't use, lacking patience. And then you get out of Nashville, and you hit 24 and 30 miles outside of Nashville, a semi's turned over, and you sit still for three to four hours. You ever been through that? I've been there. And so for me, the emerald waters of the Gulf of Mexico are gone. The sand between my toes have been replaced sometimes with brown, crusty grass in my front yard. I'll tell you what, though. There's no place like home. Guys, there's no place like home. So this morning, what we're going to do, we're going to wrap up this inaugural mission trip of the Apostle Paul and his compadres up to what we call present-day Turkey. If you're new here... We're going through the book of Acts. I see some new faces here. Uh, We're just finishing the first missionary trip of the Apostle Paul, along with Barnabas and Luke and his friends. Seven churches are planted on this first mission trip uh, on the island of Cyprus and also in present-day Turkey, outside of the Holy Land. And outside of the Holy Land, where they're planting these churches, I must remind everybody, there's nothing but synagogues, Jewish religion, and pagan religion synagogues, pagan religion. That's where they're heading into. The gospel of Jesus Christ is now on the move after the day of Pentecost. Now, they're going, this mission team, do you remember where they head out of? Anybody? I like doing quizzes. Where did the mission team, what city did they head out of? Anybody? Come on now, Colin Van Venter. They headed out of the second city, which is called Antioch, in present-day Syria. It's been a rough road. And I'll mention this, I've mentioned this before, ministry is messy, ministry at times is physically and emotionally taxing. I read a survey the other day that was done by the Barna Group, and 40% of pastors in America are right now seriously considering leaving the ministry to get into the business world. The average tenure of of a pastor in America is seven years now. Ministry is messy. Ministry is in the trenches. Then you throw in the gospel. The gospel is divisive, right? Yet the gospel saves. And so this road out of Antioch was a rough road, yet it produced salvations. A year-long tour, I see my brother Ray Young, a Vietnam vet with a tour in Vietnam. These guys spent a year-long tour in present-day Turkey preaching the gospel, and they faced rejection after rejection after rejection. We sit here today in this sanctuary comfortably and safely because our spiritual forefathers, Peter, James, John, and Paul, believed in the Great Commission. Here it is. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which we did two weeks ago, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. There's that word obey. And behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And so, church, I have to ask you, believers, do we still believe in the Great Commission? Do you believe that we're called to go and make disciples? We are. Everyone in this room today, including me, we're all called to what I call the trenches of spiritual warfare. We talked last Sunday, we were battling evil forces that we can't see. Demons and angels are fighting for the souls of men and women. And the trenches are dirty and sweaty and yucky and muddy. But the, oh, the reward, if you get in the trench of ministry work, 
The rewards are amazing. Lives made new. Lives out of addiction. Lives that were a, a heap of ashes now amazing. If you're in the trenches, you'll see heaven get crowded. And so if you decide to be what I call a, a kingdom worker, you will face hardship. It's just part of the job. It's part of the job description. Jesus said in this world you'll have trouble. And Paul said we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. Ouch. So on this missionary trip, the first one, today we're going to look at the two last church plants in Lystra and Derby before they get to come back home after a year long away from their home church. Salvation awaits this mission team. Rejection awaits the mission team. But guess what they do? They don't hightail it. They press on. My encouraging words to you today as a Christ follower in today's culture is no matter what is thrown your way, I'm telling you, stand firm in your faith and press on. It's probably going to get worse. I have an image of the, uh, for the, the mission trip. If you see the blue lines, there's Antioch in present-day Syria. They went to Cyprus. They went to Pamphylia. And that's present-day Galatia. That's where all the first mission work took place in what you would call southern Turkey. And the return trip is in the red. That sort of highlights where these guys are. So you have an image of where they are. Um, the recap. Let me give you a quick recap. Recap. On the island of Cyprus, right, there was a sorcerer named Elimus who went against the disciples, against the apostles. And what happened? He was blinded. But there was kickback against the gospel on the island of Cyprus. After the island of Cyprus and they leave Cyprus, what happens? John Mark says, I'm out of here. I'm going back home. I'm not part of the mission, any t mission team anymore. There's desertion on the trip. They get expelled from the city of Pisidian Antioch. Get out of here. We hate you. And then in Iconium, the, the citizens plan a stoning of Paul and Barnabas and Luke. And they escape and they flee. And what we see in the book of Acts repeated over time and time again Doors are open, doors are closed. The apostles stand and preach, and the apostles flee for their life. There's a time to stand, and there is a time to flee in Christ. After the imminent death threat in Iconium, yes, there was a plot. There was a coup to stone Paul. They will flee. They're going to run. There's a time to run. They will flee 20 miles south to the city called Lystra in southern Turkey, and guess what they do? They continue to preach the gospel. Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, Christ away the truth and life. They never steer away from the gospel. I'm going to say it again. The gospel saves and the gospel divides. Now, what I want, to, want you to take a look at this morning is the different responses to the gospel that take place in the city of Lystra because we're going to experience, you'll experience all of these different responses in the 21st century. The first response to the gospel that we pray for is a response of faith. Acts 14, 8 through 10. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. I see that man, his, his ankles are so messed up, he could not walk physically. He had been that way from birth, never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet! And at that moment, the man jumped up and began to walk. Now, what you need to take notice from the get-go is when they enter these cities, they're not proclaiming to be miracle workers. They're not the, on a healing tour, Okay? The focus was always on the gospel when planting churches. It was always the gospel. The miracles, if they did take place, they are a byproduct of the gospel. But the focus is always Christ crucified, Christ resurrected. Now, let's talk about this man. Lame from birth. Guys, this guy's in dire need. I don't know if he's given up on life. We just talked about everybody has a struggle. Imagine the struggle, and from the day you're born, you have never stepped one foot upright, ever. It reminds me of the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda 
who had been crippled for 38 years, and Jesus walks up, and the man's waiting to get tossed into the pool when the waters are stirred by the angel, and he can never make it there. And what does Jesus say? Hey, my brother, pick up your mat and start walking. Same type of healing here. Jesus promised that you'll be able to perform miracles even greater than me. And I always wonder, you ever read the Gospels and the New Testament? It always sees that God is, is paying attention to the lowly. He's paying attention to the outcast. He's paying attention to the divorcee. He's paying attention to the prostitute. Why is that? Why would God seek out a man in Lystra who's been crippled from the day he was born? Why does Jesus seek out a five-time divorcee who's sleeping with a man? Why would he seek her out at a well? For water? Was it just water? Why does Jesus, on the dirty road, approach a man who's a leper, who everyone else would step away from, and they would yell out, stay back? Why does he go up and hug a leper? Because God is for the outcast. You ever felt like an outcast? Have you ever felt like the shunned? Have you ever felt like no one pays attention to me? God is for the lowly. That's why God sent Paul to Lystra. Because God is searching for those who are seeking him. Are you seeking God? Are you seeking God today? I don't know who's here today, but if you've never given your life to Jesus and you're considering that, start praying about that. God is searching for you. If you notice in this story, there's no synagogue mentioned this time. Every time Paul has gone to a city, he's gone to the synagogue because religious people are there and they have the Word of God. There's no synagogue in Lystra. And more than likely, you know where this conversation about Jesus is taking place? It's at the marketplace. I guess it could happen at a Walmart. Walmart's not my favorite place to congregate at. But Paul is at a marketplace more than likely. And he's having a conversation about who Jesus is with a group of people. Yes, Jesus did die on a cross, and yes, he rose from the dead. And here's how he lived, and here's what he taught. And oh, by the way, off to the side is a leper. I'm sorry, not a leper, but a lame man. And not much attention is being given to him, but guess what he's doing? He's listening in. He's eavesdropping on the gospel. I want you to notice how this lame man responds to the grace of God and to the life of Jesus. I'm going to ask you, how have you responded to it? Number one, this outcast, this person who's not being noticed, this person who could be an annoyance, he listened attentively. The word listen here, he, was, he listened to Paul, doesn't mean sometimes what some of you do, uh, I hear Steve mumbling words, I don't know what he's saying. It's not listening to sounds. It means to pay attention intent, intently. And what it really means is to be like in a juror's box and to listen intently to the case being presented. It's like being a juror at the O.J. Simpson trial and you're listening to every detail that's spoken. That's how this lame man is listening to the gospel. He is captivated by Jesus. Secondly, his faith was evident. What does that mean? How could Paul see that he had faith? Well, two things are taking place here. Number one, Guys, I can, I can look ahead and read your body language right now. I, I can. And so Paul's reading this man's body language. He's looking at his eyes. His eyes are locked on Paul. He has eyes of attention. His eyes are probably welling up with tears, and he's probably wrenching his hands, and, and he's just excited that there's a possibility that something's going to happen today. Paul sees that. Paul also, I believe, has been given the gift of discernment. And what that means, Paul's able to hear from the Holy Spirit when to make an action, when to step forward in faith with a direct instruction from God. And so God, you know what the Holy Spirit's telling Paul? This man has faith, go heal him. Go heal him, Paul. And look what happens to the leper. He jumps. Like, listen, if I'm a leper and I'm sitting at the portico at the marketplace and Paul says, get up. And I've been crippled my entire life. I'm probably going to go very gingerly. I'm going to go like this and, and test one foot and then maybe press up and do that. This guy, you know what he does? And when he says, get up, this guy goes, whoa! He jumps. He doesn't just stand up. 
The proof of his faith was simply not standing on his defeated ankles, but jumping with those ankles. And so what this, this lame man did, he made this great transition that some struggle with. Many of Americans have heard the gospel, but they haven't made the transition to placing their faith in Christ, believing the word, and then claiming the promise that you can have eternal life in Jesus. This man did that. The word of God produced faith, and that faith produced a conversion, which also produced a physical healing. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You know, I will confess, I don't believe I have the gift of discernment, but I can see with my eyes, I'm looking out today, I can see who's listening, and I can see who's off in la-la land. I've done that. I'll confess, I've been in a, listened to a preacher preach, I'm like, I'm in la-la land. I'm looking around. <laughs> and I can tell who's about ready to drift off and fall asleep. I've seen it. Listen, I'm not offended. Not offended. I don't take it personal. We're all human. We're all weak. Jeremiah, probably the greatest prophet of all time, preached 42 years to the nation of Israel and Judah. And guess what? Only two people listened to him in 42 years. And then the rest of the story, that nation got dispersed to Babylon and Israel was crushed. Judah was crushed. So pay attention. <laughs> so the question is, as you gather today, is your faith attentive? Can I see your faith? Can I see your attention? When the Word of God is spoken, are you listening, hearing sound, or are you listening to the Word, word of God and asking it to transform your life? Here's a bigger question. Are you seeking God today, not just for show on Sunday? I went to church on Sunday. Oh, hallelujah, I'm good. But are you seeking God weekly, hourly? Not for show, just you and God. Now, no doubt this crippled man in my mind had been seeking God for years and days and probably hourly. He had never given up. And he chose to jump in faith for Jesus. You know, so much we can glean from this, this lame man's step of faith. He listened intently to the Word of God. He daily sought the presence of the living God. And he jumped in his faith in Jesus. But I will mention today that not everyone responds to the gospel of Jesus in faith. Some reject it. Here is the next response to the crowd listening in Lystra. It's a response of delusion. I'll say there's delusion and confusion swarming this country today. Confusion and delusion are swarming this country today. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, man was jumping they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was a chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths, those would be flowered wreaths, to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Them would be Paul and Barnabas. So you need to understand... Let me give you the legend of Lystra. Some of you out there are young enough or old enough. Remember the legend of Zelda, that, that video game? Let me give you the legend of Lystra. Here it is. Legend has it that years ago in the city of Lystra, the gods Zeus and Hermes decided to come upon this city to visit this city in human form. They took on human bodies. And as they visited Lystra... No one gave them a time of day. They were totally ignored, except for two people, an older couple, paid them attention. And so Zeus and Hermes, because guys, listen, the Greek gods at the time were not compassionate, and they would lash out wrathfully against their servants. Zeus and Hermes destroy Lystra, except for the older couple. And if you look, there's an image today of an old Greek temple, and there are two trees standing in front of that temple, and they believe to this day that to be the, the spirits of the older couple. That's the legend. It reminds me very much of the story of the Israelites in the, in the desert outside the Holy Land. 
and they weren't allowed into the Holy Land. They were, quote, destroyed in the desert because why? Remember that? Because they complained and grumbled. They complained and grumbled. God said, you're not getting the Holy, in the Holy Land. Two people got in, Caleb and Joshua. Why? Because they had a very positive attitude. So that's the legend of Lister. That's what, going, that's what this, this city's mindset is like. That's their religious background. The crowds listening today, they have a pagan mindset. And they're not going to blow their second opportunity to please Zeus and Hermes. And they see Zeus and Hermes in Paul and Barnabas. Can I say this real quick? Guys, beware of crowds. Beware of crowds that will ask you to conform to the ways that are against Christ. And they're out there. You know who they are. Beware of crowds. This crowd had a mind that was darkened to Christ. And it was enlightened to Greek mythology. That's what they believed in. Now, Paul and Barnabas, they, they don't understand this Lyconian language. And so this is all gibberish to them. They don't know what's going on. They hear Zeus and Hermes. But then it all makes sense when they start bringing out bulls. And they've got butchering tools. They have machetes and, and knives. And they're like, oh my gosh. They're going to sacrifice bulls. They believe we're gods. Barnabas, they think we're gods. We can't have this. They think we actually have the power to, to heal this man. And so we see the predicament, guys, if the word of God is not proclaimed, if we don't speak up about Jesus. Because here, a great miracle was performed, but there was no conviction of faith. No one came to leave. The gospel hadn't been presented yet. And so a very superstitious and carnal crowd, which we live in today, can, they will interpret signs and wonders and even miracles because they take place today. And I'll say even good works. They will take those in according to their own personal religion. Atheist, agnostic, that's just part of a good life, a good planet we live on. The gospel must accompany miracles and good works if we hope to influence anyone to the person of Jesus Christ. How can they believe in him if they don't hear his name and hear his story, not yours? Let me ask you today, are you superstitious? The black cat, some of the other superstitions that float around today, are you superstitious? You know, the world will tempt you to be superstitious, and the world will tempt you today to what I call co-worship. The world will tempt the Christian today to co-worship, worship Jesus, and then worship this culture. Worship some of our gods, it's okay, blend in. That's a temptation for us today. Go ahead and worship your money, worship your possessions, your houses, your boats, your cars, your status. Guys, they're going to tempt you to worship people. You know, I, I just looked this up for the heck of it. Taylor Swift, 10, 11 million followers. She has the whole city of Chicago that follows her religiously. They believe in what she believes in. They try to dress like she dresses. They follow her. The church is being tempted to follow the world. Stand firm. Stand firm. Beware of crowds. So we know that Jesus, John 1, 14, says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. And with this beautiful gospel of grace, which I love grace, there it is. Grace, we're saved by grace. You cannot neglect truth. And so Paul and Barnabas respond with truth. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they're going to sacrifice bulls for us? They tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human, like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And so the first exclamation is, Listen, we're not gods, we're humans just like you. And oh, by the way, there is one living God. Zeus and Hermes are fake. They're not real. There is only one living God. And when they tear their clothing, that's blasphemy. That's what they're saying. You guys are committing blasphemy. I am not a God. It's the same as what the high priest did when Jesus proclaimed, yep, I am the Son of God. He tore his clothes. Blasphemy. This is a call of blasphemy upon the crowds who have no idea what they're doing. 
So they give him good news. The good news, what is it? Christ was crucified for your sins, your sin predicament. Christ is not like your gods. He's loving and compassionate. He says, come to me. Christ offers you forgiveness. Christ will not retaliate you against you. Christ will not punish you. You have eternal life in Christ. That's the good news. And then comes the harsh truth. It's repent. Right here. Turn. Turn from those worthless things. How many of us need to hear, turn away from that worthless thing? And so what they heard was, we're following Zeus and Hermes in Greek mythology. He says, stop. Turn. And he says, turn. Turn to the cross. Turn to the cross. Turn to the cross of grace. That's what he's telling them. He's telling them the truth. Unless you repent, you cannot be saved. Let me tell you some truth. Are you guys familiar with Penn and Teller, the comedian duo act? I think Penn's the big guy and Teller's a little quiet guy or whatever. Twelve years ago, Gillette uh, Penn gave an interview. and he's a, he's a professing atheist. After one of his shows, he had a, a gentleman walk up to him and handed him a little Bible. He didn't know what it was called. It was a Gideon's Bible. It was the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. And this guy said, I just want you to have the Word of God. My phone number's in here. I want you to read this because I, I want you to have life eternal. And he handed it to Gillette Penn. And the way this guy handled himself with grace and love, and he wasn't forcing himself, Gillette Penn said this. He said, I, I can't believe that, that Christians today, and, and I don't believe like you, but Christians today, if they truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and, and if they truly believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and those without Jesus won't make it to heaven, which I don't believe, but why don't any of them speak about that? No, why don't they come to the lost and actually speak about it like this guy did to me? And I don't think Jen Gillette Penn ever made a decision to follow Jesus, but he was enamored by this guy. He believed it so much. Here's the gift of eternal life. Look at it. And the question was, why do so many Christians shy away from sharing the gospel? That's coming from an atheist. Ugh. Makes you think, doesn't it? Guys, you have the power. The Holy Spirit lives in you. You have John 3, 16. You have Romans 10, 9. You have 1 Peter 3, 18 that Tammy said. So after this response of truth, two different faiths appear. Number one, it's fickle faith. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. There's that word crowd again. And they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. So what that really means is once he was stoned, he's knocked unconscious. They grab him by the collar, probably a quarter of a mile, and toss him in the dirt. That's just what happened here. Who did this? These Jews from Antioch and Iconium. You know where they came from? Way up north. You know where Antioch, the city in Antioch is? A hundred miles north of Lystra. So what that means is these Jews got a bunch of other Jews together who despised the gospel, who hated Paul, who, who loved the law and despised grace, and they said, we're tracking this man down. And they secretly tracked him down 100 miles to Lystra. That is hatred. Who's going to travel by foot 100 miles to, to harm against another person? These guys would. They hated change. They hated what Jesus stood for. It was change. It was going from the law of Moses to the grace of Jesus, and that's not right. We're putting a stop to it. And so the promise of Jesus came true on this day in Lystra. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. You're to love the world. You're to love those in the world, but you're not part of it. Therefore, the world hates you. Man, I don't like to hear that. But Jesus said it. Oh my gosh, forgive me. I just said I don't want to hear that. And you said it, Lord. And so I don't want anybody to hate me. I don't want to offend anybody. It would be ludicrous for me to go up to a non-believer who's a friend of mine and just bash him over the head with the Bible and say, you better get saved, you're going to hell. Stop doing this, this, and this. That would be ludicrous to go at him with a mentality of, I'm going after you. I don't even want to be disliked. 
I'm that guy. I, I want to like everybody. I want everybody to like me. But guess what? The gospel is offensive. The gospel is audacious. The teachings of Jesus, even in the church, can hurt feelings. Therefore, people will dislike me and people will dislike you. Stand firm and press on. These crowds that were ready to kill the fattened calves in honor of Paul and Barnabas, now we see fickle faith. They once were ready to honor these men with thousands of dollars of meat, and now they're ready to kill them. What they're really doing is, you know what they're doing? These wreaths that they brought, they were wreaths of flowers. They dropped the flowers of Christ's likeness, if you will, and they picked up stones of hatred. How often have you been tempted to drop the flowers of Christ's likeness, to drop the flowers of grace, and pick up a stone of dissension? Can't do, we can't operate that way, church. Here we see the proof of miracles, the good works, without the Word of God, without the Gospel, are not enough to save a person. Someone must hear, someone must hear about Jesus. So let me give you a warning real quick. Beware of what I call doctrine worship. There will be preachers out there today that will preach more doctrine than Jesus. Beware of that. Although I love doctrine, I think doctrine is solid. But beware of doctrine worship. Beware of hero worship. Guys, I love all you Cub Cardinal fans, but beware of worshiping a team and worshiping an athlete, of worshiping a pop star. They're just human. And I'll add this too upon myself. Be aware of pastor worship. It takes place. The devil's desire for every believer is that your faith actually be fickle. That's what he wants from you. You know, that you turn away from Christ. That when there's a time of struggle and dissension, oh, it's getting tough, I'm just going to walk away for a while. I don't want any of that stuff. He'll, he's trying to sway you to follow the ways of this culture today. And actually, the devil leaps for joy. The devil leaps for joy at your lukewarmness. You know, Jesus said in Revelation 3, I'd rather have you be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, nobody knows where you stand. You're a chameleon. So beware of fickle faith. Don't blend in. Stand firm. Press on. Then we see uh, this story just blows my mind, guys. I have two of these. Are you kidding me? In my nose. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So here we go to my, are you kidding me, part of this message. Paul, knocked out unconscious. And guys, these stones aren't little bitty rocks you skim across the river. These are softball and football-sized stones. Sometimes they would throw a person down and they would drop stones upon the body. I believe Paul is standing while he's being stoned. Now to be knocked unconscious, Paul was being struck upon the body, the torso with stones, but to be knocked out, the man, he got hit in the head repeatedly. Hey, guys, Paul looks like a hockey player who's been in a 12-minute fight. He's bruised and cut. He's probably got a couple of teeth missing. That's why, and he's laying on the ground unconscious. And some scholars believe he is near death from that stoning. Galatians 6, Paul will write. This is so ironic. He will write six months later to this exact church, to this exact area, and he'll say this, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Paul carried the scars of Christ. I want you to take a look at what fixed faith looks like with a, very, with a group of very, very, very young believers who are now witnessing the possible stoning of the second martyr, Stephen, now Paul. Listen to verse 20. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, and entered the city? Seriously? Are you kidding me? The, listen, the 12 disciples minus Judas. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? The crowd comes. The rioters come. The mob comes to arrest Jesus. What do the disciples do? They all flee like jackrabbits being hunted down by a pack of coyotes. They flee. They abandon him. These are baby disciples. Guys, these are new Christians. They might only be in a Christian for a few months, a few weeks. They're in crisis mode. The leader of the church appears dead. We are in the minority. We are babies in Christ. What are we going to do? What do they do? They stand around 
Paul. Literally, they're taking a risk with their own lives. They actually form what I call a circle up. They form a circle around the Apostle Paul. These young believers stay there knowing death could be upon them. You know what they do? They start to pray over Paul. Wow. There must have been some great discipleship going on for these young believers to say, we got to pray. And they begin to pray with joint hearts. And many scholars believe that that saved Paul from his death. There is only one reason I can think of that these young disciples, maybe only a few months old, chose to stand their ground and press on in the face of adver- advertisement rather than flee. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They understand to live through the Spirit. You know, I love it every Sunday. I don't, I don't expect the all, people to come to the altar every Sunday. I'm glad they do. You know what happens at the altar usually when someone comes to the, to the prayer altar? Someone is under attack. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, they're lost, they're hurt, they're grieving, they're in need. And what happens? People circle around them and pray over them. That's what's happening here. I love it when people come to the altar and we circle around people. My other, you got to be kidding me, is Paul. (laughs) Who gets up from a stoning, knocked out, bleeding and battered, and says, I'm going back in the city, guys. Here I go. Don't stop me. Right? You know what that is? You know, Rocky 1, way better than Rocky 2 or 3. I'm sorry, but Rocky 1 is awesome. This is Rocky Balboa on the canvas in his corner saying, stay down. Stay down. It's the manager. Get up. Rocky, I'm throwing in the towel. And he says, no, no, you don't. Don't you throw in the towel. <laughs> That's what Paul's doing. Don't you throw in the towel. I'm going back in the city. I need to go back in the city. Now, why would, guys, we wouldn't do that. If I went on a street corner of Matt Toon and preached the gospel and I got the, the tar beat out of me, I'm probably just going to go home and say, honey, bandage me up. Thank God that Luke was there. He's probably bandaging up right now. But why would Paul go back into the city? Let me give you two reasons. Number one, the Holy Spirit told him to. Paul, get up and go back in the city. There's a reason. And so Paul just gets up and goes in the city. The second reason that Paul goes back into the city of Lystra is found in Acts chapter 16, verse 1, which tells us there was a young man named Timothy who lived in Lystra with his mother and father. His mother was a Jew. His father was a Greek. He's a half-breed. And young Timothy will be part of the next mission team. And I believe reason number two that Paul goes back into the city is because Timothy needs Jesus. That's why. There's a good reason that Paul went back and, shared, and went back and shared the gospel with Timothy, who might have witnessed the stoning, who's now hearing the gospel. And Timothy says, man, I just heard about the story of Jesus. I heard this man stand up and courage for his faith in Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. And so Timothy probably is born again from this experience. I will tell you today, there are people in this city of Mattoon, in your city where you're from, that are waiting on your courage to share the gospel. They're waiting. There are people waiting. Now we're going to get to the return home. They finally get to go home after a year. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, and then they went to Iconium, and then they went to Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith, and that's stand firm, press on. When they get to Derby... They're probably, oh, thank you, Lord. There's no drama. There's no drama in Derby. No attacks, no rejections, just people getting saved. And it's a continual preaching of the gospel, making disciples. Now, the return trip home, which is amazing, guess where they're going? They're going back to the cities that hate them, but God is able to do amazing more than we can ever imagine or dream. And so when they go back to the doors of Iconium and Antioch, they're welcomed back in. And they're going to do follow-up work. Let me show you. I'll show you the map one more time. So blue is the initial trip, Cyprus, southern Turkey, and now they're all the way to Derby, that far right arrow. That's the end of the mission trip, and look where they go. Well, let's go back to Lystra and Iconium and Pisidia. So they go back to where they got rejected, all the way back to Antioch. That's the return trip home. And there's no confrontation on the return trip home. And here's what happens when they go back to the churches they had planted. And this is what we can learn as a church. 
Here's how we grow as a church, United Christian Church. Here's how we sustain our growth. Number one, there has to be strengthening in the church. I'll compare this to physical training. You know, we have Bo and Ashley Scott who, who teach and, and help people in their physical training of their bodies with prior, proper diet, proper exercise. You know what this team did when they went back to Iconium? They went back to that city and they worked out with the believers. They worked out with them. You know what that meant? Hey, guys, let's have a quiet time together. Let's study the Word of God together. Let's pray together. Let's fellowship together. Let's take Holy Communion together. Let's fast for a day. That's what they did. They gave them a workout plan, and it was the holy habits. Here's how you grow, guys. They followed up. Secondly, the second thing they did was they encouraged one another. Every church they went to, it was an encouraging time. Guys, this is not Bobby Knight style of encouragement. They're not grabbing people by the neck saying, hey, follow Jesus. It's the opposite of Bobby Knight. It's a positive attitude with truth. It's to these new believers. You got this. God is for you, not against you. Press on. Continue in your grace. Continue in unity. Be unified. They had to encourage these young believers. Guys, listen, you all know this. It's no small thing in today's culture where we live to walk continually for Jesus day after day. And then, hey, year after year, it's a challenge to do that today in this culture. We all, including me, we all need encouragement in Christ. Then we see this, this word organizing. Yeah, it's in the Bible. They organize things. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord. They committed the elders to the, to the work of continuing in the church. Paul wrote in the Corinthians, to the Corinthians, there should be order in a worship service. This ordaining of the elders to care for the flock, it shows the need. There should be order and organization within a church. It's right there. They appointed elders to lead. That's our model here. We are an elder-driven church and a, and a ministry team-empowered church. And so we've mimicked our governmental model after this model. And I'll give a shout-out to our elders, say thank you for what you do, but also a call. You are to shepherd with grace and truth, and you're to lean into grace. I'm going to end with this. Johnny, praise man, come on up. And then lastly, we see there's this thing called reporting. Yeah, reporting is in the message. Yeah, they reported and then they rested. On arriving home, they gathered the church together. This is Antioch, home church, friends and families and cousins. Hey, I'm so glad to be home. And reported all that God had done, not what they had done, what God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Guys, the pagan Gentiles are following Jesus. It's amazing. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. And so a church, if we're going to grow and sustain ourselves, we need to know things, right? You need to know things. Not only the vision to be a unified body of believers whose visible love for Christ and one another will draw our community and our world into relationship with Jesus. That's our vision. But you need to know what's going on now. And last week, and in the future, the church needs to be transparent with the family, right? And we try our best to do that. That's why on August 20th, we'll have a, an informational meeting, a transparent meeting of what's going on in this church. I hope you can attend. Then I want to focus on this. is really difficult for Americans today. It's that word rest. I don't know what you're all going to do when you get home. I know what we're going to do. We're going to the fair, I think. <laughs> I'd love to go home and take a nap. But uh, what they do, these guys, they take about a two-year sabbatical. It's not that they take a break from making disciples and worshiping, but they take a two-year break because they need to breathe. They need some silence. They need some solitude for a while before they get back in the trenches. Guys, we all need a break from time to time. You need to step back and just, <sighs> just, Get rid of the busyness for a day. Maybe it's Sunday. Maybe it's Friday evening. I don't know what it is. Everyone in this room, I want to give you a really simple challenge. Sometime this next, next week, two things. I'm going to ask you to take a nap, which I'm signing up for three of them. Take a nap or do this. 
go outside, lay in the grass, and for 30 minutes just watch the clouds pass by and don't say a word. We all need to rest. We all need a Salem moment where we can breathe. It's part of being a Christian. And sometimes in America, we love busyness over rest. Don't neglect it. So a couple questions before we leave today. This is a hard one. What will it take for you to back down from following Jesus? Is it peer pressure? Is it promotion? Is it money? Is it happiness? Is it I don't want to offend anybody? What will it take to force you to back down from following Jesus and proclaiming him as Lord? Stand firm, press on. And lastly, who are you going to encourage this week? That was the, the, the main emphasis of the tr return trip back was to encourage the church. Who are you going to encourage this week? No, seriously. I'm going to ask the husbands to encourage your wives, and wives encourage your husbands. But everyone here, this week, your challenge is you're going to give someone a call or face-to-face, -face, and you're going to encourage somebody outside of your family with a word of encouragement. Man, you're, you are, I, I love your walk with Jesus. Well, I, I want to pray for you. I want us all to be encouragers this week. It's so important for this church to grow in Christ. I mentioned the altar and the, the circle around the altar. If there's anyone in here today, you've never truly given your life to Jesus. You're like, I want to follow Jesus. I want life eternal. I don't want to fear death. I don't want to fear hell. I want purpose. You can come to the altar. I'd love to pray with you. But as always, if there's anyone in need, anybody with a struggle, anybody wants to be prayed over for whatever reason, the altar is always open. It's a place where we encircle one another and we love one another.